Welcome to the Shiro's of Beijing Stories, the podcast series, brought to you by UN Women Nigeria and Women in Successful Careers, WISCA. In this series, we would be sharing and celebrating stories of women's activism in Nigeria. The women in this podcast were present in the Fourth World Conference on Women, popularly tagged Beijing 1995, and their extensive and impactful experience and commitment to the empowerment of women is why we continue to celebrate them. At Whisker, we believe in the power of a shared story in leading the next generation to aspire, grow, and contribute to nation building. We hope you will be inspired as you listen. Welcome to another episode of the Shiras of Beijing, the podcast series. Amina Oyagwala, founder and chairperson of Whisker, will be in conversation with Professor Stella Williams. Professor Williams is the founder of the Nigerian Women in Agriculture Research for Development, NIWOD, and holds a PhD in fisheries and allied aquaculture from Urban University, Alabama. She is a retired professor of agricultural economics from the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, and a former chair of African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Award. She serves as Vice Chair, Board of Trustees of the International Potato Center and as Vice President, Mundus Maris, Sciences and Art for Sustainability of the Sea. Professor Williams has served on international, regional and national boards and expert groups for the last three decades. She is a fellow of the Fisheries Society of Nigeria, African Association of Agricultural Economics, and a Fulbright Fellow. Welcome. I have the pleasure of having Professor Stella Williams with me in the studio this afternoon. Thank you, Prof for making time to be with us today. Thank you also for your leadership and your mentorship. I'm really looking forward to our very, very rich conversation this afternoon on gender equality. Thank you for all the great work that you do in your field of agriculture and fisheries, and most importantly, in the field of women empowerment. So let's get right into it. Prof. In the newly released book, The Shiros of Beijing, telling the Nigerian stories 25 years after, you said that there are big gaps to be filled to achieve gender equality. You also talked about women's political representation in the National Assembly and in the executive arms of government. You talked about women's empowerment in agricultural transformational agenda to enhance productivity, women's positions in professional and private sector leadership, and women's voices in decision-making in Nigeria at all levels. Prof, what needs to be done to bridge the gap across these identified areas? Thank you, Mrs. Wayamala. It's simple, and it's just education. Not degree, not certification, not diploma. Reasoning through, thinking, knowing that your decision result in consequences. If we can educate ourselves to be able to take custody of what we do, how we do it, why we do it, for whom we do it, then we will be able to bridge those gaps. That, my, is what is missing. Yes, people go to school. They get all this, but they can't do simple things. 
Think. 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 Thank you, Prof. This is a good segue into, you know, my next question, which is really about the competence and capabilities of women to lead nations, which, as you know, is not in doubt. Indeed, the countries that have managed the coronavirus uh, pandemic, COVID-19, best, you know, in the past year, have all been led by women. Do you think that this realization will help to change the landscape and help to accelerate the inclusion of more women in political leadership positions in Nigeria? I have no doubt. However, it also takes a two to tango. We need the men to appreciate that their wives, their sisters, their cousins are just as important as the male figure. Once we are able to bridge that gap, I am telling you, Nigeria would be better. Because a home where there is an educated, reasoning mother, sister, aunt, and things like that, makes progress step by step because they work together. They support each other. They encourage each other. They inspire each other. These are missing. And this is the reason why you find that people become very sheepish. You have to tell me what you want me to do. You have to tell me how you want me to do it. With whom I should. <laughs> These are things that are slowing awesome. the progress. I mean, I grew up in Lagos where for as long as I can remember as a baby, we were surrounded by family and they were all educated. And we didn't have to wonder or wonder around we see, we hear, we take action. And this is the reason why a lot of us were able to be who we are as activists mm. right from school. So, Prof, what is the role of the mother mm -hmm. at home, you know, in terms of how the mother influences the boy and the girl child in terms of their upbringing? Because that's where it all starts. Oh, yes. Let me take my mom. Mm. My mom raised 24 of us. Out of that 24, only four of us were her biological children. But you dare not say that in our home. Because as far as she's concerned, all 24 of us are her children. But the basic thing is that she's number one, our friend. Not our mother. Our companion. Our confidant. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a household where my brothers knew how to back young children. Because my mother believed that once they get married, it's not just the woman who should do everything. They, as the men, should be able to cook and pamper their wives. Should be able to change the nappies. Should be able to bait the child. It should be and a partnership. Dress. Yeah. Right. It should be a partnership. Yeah. It's not a question of he comes home from work, puts his feet on the desk, <laughs> and be reading newspaper yes. or watching television. It's a question of before she he goes out to work in the morning, they are both in the kitchen, getting the children ready for school, and when we come back, they are both helping with the homework and things like that. My brothers can braid a girl's hair. My brothers can sew. My brothers can grind. Because at that time, we were grinding on stone. It's so important that they're able to participate in these things from the home from so that the they can home. understand the concept of the unpaid care work Thank and you. what it means to run a home in addition to also sustaining a career. I'd just like to bring us back, Prof, yes, to please. the conversation to focus more on women now and to your contribution, you know, as an author to the book, The Shearers of Beijing. You concluded your chapter in the book with a very powerful quote, and I quote, train a woman, you said, and you empower a nation. Train a girl child, 
and you save a family. Train every female scientist and your innovative skills will lead to economic growth. What needs to be done, Prof, for leaders to understand that real development cannot occur unless we embrace all our talents in Nigeria, both male and female? Because the population, if we look at it statistically, is 50% male, 50% female. In other words, it's that partnership that you mentioned earlier. Therefore, if the mother, right from childhood, is happy to be a female and not envious of the male child and wanting to be a he-she when she grows up because they can only dictate what to be done. But if she in her fine feminine form can be who she is, but knowing her responsibility as a mother, as a friend, as a confidant, from her children, from her husband, that is a happy home right there. Because the children will come and share with their mother or their father their fears for them to say, oh, no. Don't be like that. Yes, it's normal. But why don't you do it this way or do it that way? Instead of having to listen to somebody who is out of your realm telling you what to do and with whom to do it. And this is why you find that the role of a woman is not just about being a wife. It's not just being a mother. It's been a friend, a good listener. Mm. It's multifaceted. I mean, we, we, we wear uh, different hats. You know, you, you have the woman as a career woman, the woman you. as a worker, the woman as a wife, a sister, a daughter, you know, a friend. You know, there's so many hats, you know, that we wear, you know, as women. And that is why they say women are very good at multitasking. Most as you know, them. in the world that we're in today, Prof., <laughs> the skill sets that you acquire and that you know I have been honed by women over the years are the skill sets that are required in the modern age, which is why you know these leading global women were so successful in the right. various countries because they have this, this what they used to call the, the soft skills. Those are actually strategic <laughs> skills. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. you know organizations are looking for those skills of now course, because of pretty much everything else can be done by robots, right, with artificial intelligence. And one of the things that is sad mm. about the current system mm. is that. While we were growing up, mm. we were also multilingual. Mm. That's missing now. Mm. Most of our youths can only speak English and none of our languages. None of, none of the vernacular. None. Very sad. Very sad. Very none. sad. Mm. And, and that speaks to identity. You it know, does. And culture. And not only that, for who you are. Mm. If you are happy to be who you are, you enjoy this. Before a child becomes 10, that child can speak up to 10 languages, languages without translation. And we are missing that now. It used to be part of what, how we grew up. Again, where does that responsibility lie? In the home. <laughs> and it's for both men and women. women. It's not just the mother. Because we put too much emphasis on the mother has to train a child. I mean, I grew up where they said, when the child is good and successful, that's a father's, father's child. child. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I mean, it's a multitask. Mm -hmm. And again, what is also missing is where you have the grandparents. We grew up having our grandparents around, around us. And they are our he and she mm -hmm. heroes. But it's also missing now. Yeah. It's too much of a nuclear, nuclear family. It's unfortunate. It is. And the people they're seeing in the developed world with, corona, with the coronavirus and what happened in the past year, that the social construct that we have in Africa and that supports this system Thank and you. that community culture is actually what has enabled us in the African countries, in, on the African continent, to be able to sustain you know, the pandemic the way we have, that love, because a lot of the isolation that, you know, they felt in the developed world has actually affected, you know, their own people and led to a lot of mental health. Uh, right. So, Prof, 
I think this is a very good time for us to take a short break to listen to one of the 12 critical areas for action and concern from the Beijing Platform for Action. And we'll be right back, so please stay with us. The 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action flags 12 key areas where urgent action was needed to ensure greater equality and opportunities for women and men, girls and boys. It also laid out concrete ways for countries to bring about change. UN Women works with governments and partners to ensure such change is real for women and girls around the world. Critical area of concern number nine, human rights of women. Women and girls are entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of all of their human rights. The Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action confirms that protection and promotion of human rights is the first responsibility of governments and core to the work of the United Nations. UN Women provides technical assistance to ensure that states create national laws, policies and plans to ensure women's rights and protect them against violations. We promote international treaties such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW, we lobby decision makers to ensure that adequate laws are passed and work with partners to train and educate the law enforcement and justice officials who must implement them. And that was one of the critical areas of concern from the Beijing Platform for Action. Welcome back. I am in conversation with Professor Stella Williams, an academic, a farmer, an agriculturalist, and a gender activist. She is one of contributors to the book, The Shiro's of Beijing. So, Prof, welcome back. From your experience as a gender activist and advocate for women's economic empowerment, can you share what lessons you think the next generation of gender activists should learn from the gender equality movement to ensure that we make significant progress by 2030 in line with the UN SDG goals. Furthermore, what must we continue to challenge and question to move things forward? Well, one of the things we learned is that at least we've been able to make enough known that the women are not so fragile that they will break, but that they are strong enough to face whatever challenges needs to be looked at. And this is why the Sustainable Development Goals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are really critical, starting from education to nutrition to health, then to the gender issue. Currently, we now need to actually think too, not just about the girl child, but the boy child, because we're talking about gender now. We need to think through that as to how to begin to come to parity, because our four parents were thinking about the boy child as the heir apparent and the women as despair. The table turned around with the various women's conferences from Mexico to Kenya and then Beijing. And now, 25 years after, as we are evaluating and assessing the situation, we need to look at both the girl child and the boy child and see how we can begin to equalize how 
to make things happen going forward. And for me, I'm hoping that our book would help to pave that ground because the Habat Macaulay's of the past, the Obafemi Awolowas of the past, the Adeto Kumbo of the past and things like that can now dovetail into our book to see that we are now bringing up the two sexes. Without the two sexes, we go nowhere. Thank you so much um, for that, Prof. I mean, women hold up half the sky and, you know, we represent 50% of the population. We must ensure that, you know, that 50% is able to actualize its, uh, its full potential in the interest of, you know, our shared prosperity. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, here with us, you know, uh, on this platform for this conversation uh, with Whisker and UN Women. But before we close, I'm sure our listeners would like, you know, to hear a little bit more about your experience in Beijing 25 <laughs> years ago. That was a long time ago. I won't tell you how old I was, and you know that I was a really little girl. I'd like you to take us back to those 25 years when you were at Beijing, personally, and the work that you have since done on, in the women empowerment and gender space. Thank you. One of the things that struck me when we arrived in Beijing is how well prepared the Chinese were to actually put into place not only where we were going to have the meetings, but the various kiosks, where the various groups, because we were from all over the world and we came in our numbers. And the African women really made a splash. Because I think Beijing was not ready for the power <laughs> that came from Africa. Because they thought that we were such bush people that we will just be following the Western world. But they were taken aback because they saw the political realm where Nana from uh, Ghana, the wife of late General Robin, and the uh, Maria Mabacha had a kind of forum where they were actually pissing everybody off. And it was like, whoa, what is going on? And then those of us, because I was with the Soroptimist, we were with the girl-child education aspect. And they came to see what we were doing. They could not believe the six goals that we had all prepared for. And so at the end of the Beijing conference, we were all one. That sisterhood, it was global. It was not regional. It was not continental. It was global. one. Mm. One. So I came back home energized. Mm -hmm. that, Inspired. Okay, yes. Now I can really begin what I have dreamt all my life wanting to do. That's awesome. <sighs> awesome. It was fantastic. Awesome. And awesome. Well. And you can still see it because you saw what we were able to do with you as Wiska and UN. Yes. The 25 of us that you brought together, we were always on fire. Mm. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. And that what gives me hope. The power of the African spirit, the power of the African soul, mm -hmm. and the power of the African women <laughs> and men. You know, but honestly, we, we must get beyond where we are today, where, you know, we have refused to utilize this latent asset, mm. you know, that we have staring at us in the face mm. and ensuring that... Um, we bring, fully include women and ensure that we embrace women and enable them to thrive and contribute to the development of this great continent. Mm. I'm proudly Nigerian, I'm proudly African, and I'm sure you are too, Oh, prof. yes, very much yes. so. Thank you very much, Prof, for being with us today. Uh, it has been an amazing session with you, even further inspired yet again. <laughs> Thank you again for, you know, taking the time to make your very insightful contributions in this phenomenal book, The Sheroes of Beijing. And uh, thank you for participating in this podcast. And I should thank you too and congratulate you for the good work that you're doing with the young African women 
especially the professionals. Thank you for the job. We thank, thank God you. for his mercies and the opportunity to Amen. serve. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Shiro's of Beijing podcast series. For more insights, follow us up across our social media handles. Follow UN Women on Twitter at UN Women Nigeria. Follow Whisker on Instagram at WhiskerNG and Whisker Nigeria on Facebook and LinkedIn or at Africa Business Radio.